Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 241, which reads as follows. Asajaya malamanta Anuttana malaghara Malangvannasa kosajang Pamado rakato malang Which means Lack of recitation is a blemish on spiritual teachings Lack of industry is a blemish on the household life Laziness is a blemish on beauty And negligence is a blemish of a guard Again, we're in the malavaga, which mala means blemish or stain or corruption. Something that detracts from or, or undermines or weakens something. Mars something. Makes something less perfect. So this verse was apparently taught in r regards to a story about Laludai. Laludai was a monk in the time of the Buddha and he was well known for his general lack of wisdom or even common sense. He was always getting into trouble of some sort or another. He doesn't seem to have been terribly evil, just didn't think things through very well or didn't have a sense of mindfulness or self-awareness. Pretty good example of how not to be. But not necessarily evil Just said the wrong things and didn't have any self-possession or self-awareness To help him to see what was appropriate to say and appropriate to do Very inappropriate sort of person Apparently fairly arrogant as well Or, or uh, oh, he had his defilements Because one day a group of Householders came to the monastery and offered alms in the morning and then listened to the teachings from the monks. Probably, Ser apparently, Sariputta and Moggallana were teaching. So, after the, the talk, they were standing around, gathered, and they started remarking to themselves how wonderful was the teachings of Sariputta, the Buddha's chief disciple, and Moggallana, his Second, second chief disciple, this pair of very special monks. How they were praising them, how great they were, and how great their teaching was. How wonderful it was to hear them when the Buddha wasn't able to teach. And Laludai heard this, and he said to them, hmm, "Well, that's because you've only heard them speak." He said, "Imagine if you heard me teach the Dhamma." And they heard this and, and they thought to themselves, wow, this must be some great teacher for him to be that sure of himself. And they thought to himself, oh, it would be great if someday we could hear him teach. So, on some other day, as lay people are in, in Buddhism or, or want to do, they approached the Ludai and, and invited him to give the teaching. They said, we're going to give alms today, give food to the monks today. We'd like you to be the one to give us a teaching after the meal. And the Ludei was, he accepted it, said sure. And the day came and they offered food to the monks and invited the Ludei to ascend to this very special Dhamma seat that they made. They would often have this very uh, elaborate ornamental chair to to signify the appreciation and the reverence to the Dhamma. And it was the one example where 
uh, a junior monk could sit higher than a senior monk because we put the Dhamma up as the highest the teachings the, the, the truth and so he got up on this chair a very special chair a very special occasion and they have this fan that you put in front of your face because when teaching you don't want there was a tradition to not have people look at, at you you, know, you don't want to be focused on the person the idea is for the teacher to be a vessel a conduit, a catalyst for the teaching not the source of it we don't want to be focused on the person we want to be focused on the teachings this is why we're often encouraged when we listen to a Dhamma talk to close our eyes try and be as mindful as we can so our mind is clear and we're focused on the teachings put the fan in front of his face and you know, fiddled with it a little bit and fidgeted but he knew nothing of the Dhamma he knew nothing of the teachings and so he couldn't teach a single thing so he just sat there and everyone's wondering what's happening and then he said you know I think it's better if someone else teaches I will instead uh, do a recitation so I guess this was a tradition I don't really understand it but it seems there was a tradition of also reciting the Dhamma rather than expl explaining it in a talk there would be someone who would recite the Buddhist teaching for the, for the lay people so that was another tradition I guess on the Uposatha it, it even occurs now in modern times in Thailand they'll have these sorts of recitations or special teachings where they just recite a teaching reading it from rote intoning it kind of and they, the people were like okay and so they found some other monk invited someone else to teach and that monk gave the teaching and then invited Ud, uh, Laludai to give a recitation and Laludai got up but but he couldn't recite any better than he could uh, teach. He hadn't memorized any of the teachings, so it was useless. And he said, you know, this isn't the right time for me. He said, I'll, I will do the recitation tonight. Find someone else to do it this morning. So, okay, very well. They got found someone else to do it. And they practiced during the day, practiced the teachings, and maybe discussed the teachings, asking questions or spending their time in the monastery, maybe going home to do work, but then in the evening coming back for the evening teaching, and they invited him to give a recitation. And he, he stood up there and he said, you know, this, this is, I can't do it at night. He said, tomorrow morning, have someone else do it now. I'll give the teaching, to, I'll give the recitation tomorrow morning. And here they were getting a little bit fed up, but they said, okay, and so in the morning... Again, they invited him up there, and again he was silent. He could, no, he could no more teach it in the evening or in the morning than he could the day before. And at this point, they were completely fed up, and the text says they picked up dirt and stones and sticks, maybe, in a threatening manner, and they were like, look, you... Uh, look, you, you talk down about the Buddha's chief disciples bragging about you being a better teacher than them you certainly better have something to teach us and the Lude saw these, these people who honestly weren't acting all that Buddhist but were, were, doing so, were, were certainly passionate about protecting the, the chief disciples reputation and, and calling this monk to account and so he got up and ran, and the people ran after him, and he ran and, and uh, stumbled and fell into a cesspool. And later on the monks were talking about this state of affairs and what happened, and apparently this was a thing that, that had happened in a past life. There's a Jataka story, and the Buddha heard them, and he said to them, oh, this wasn't the first time. He said in a past life, Lalude was a jackal. And I don't remember the exact story, but it's something about a jackal. Uh, a jackal was um, 
challenging a lion to a duel and said, I'm the king of beasts, you are not the king of beasts. And so the lion said, okay, well, let's fight. And then the jackal defecated on it itself or something. And, uh, and the lion was like, you know what? If you want to win so bad, I give it to you. If this is your way of winning, then you can, you, you can have the win. Anyway, there's a Jataka story. And Lalude was the jackal in that birth. And then the Buddha said, you know, Laludai, his big problem was even though he'd learned, or even if he had learned the teaching, is he never spent any time memorizing it, remembering it. And so when called to teach it, he couldn't teach. And then he taught this verse. So the big lesson we get from the story, obviously, is don't be like Laludai, don't be arrogant. I think the, the 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 subtle lesson is one of self awareness, as I said, self possession. It it shows a remarkable lack of self possession, self awareness, whatever the word is, on his behalf, on his part, uh, in in insulting and and demeaning the the chief disciples, and in in propping himself up to an extent that he couldn't deliver on. And so I, I think it's rare for someone to be so uh, unself-aware or with such a lack of self-awareness to come to that sort of state of affairs, but it does show how important it is that when we do or say anything, that we are in possession of mindfulness and, and self-awareness. That we often do or say things unthinkingly and they get us into trouble. Not because we were malicious necessarily, but on a whim. We might say something, we might promise something, we might cause uh, insult or, or expectation in others or misunderstanding in others. And, and just in general do and say things that cause suffering and, and trouble. So that is a lesson. The lesson of the verse is in four parts. Each one of them has its own lesson, I think. And so the first part is uh, relating to what we call manta, which is an interesting word. It's where we get the modern word mantra. The Sanskrit for manta would be mantra, and that's where the word mantra comes from. And it's a word that's used to to describe, used to refer to spiritual teachings, um, even magical words, magical verses. So there would have been uh, certain teachings that became considered to be in and of themselves powerful. And by reciting those verses, it was a magic uh, those magical words, incantations, like abracadabra or something. And people would recite them to themselves. You see this even in, in Buddhism today. There is groups of people who call themselves Buddhists whose whole practice is to recite mantras without any sense of understanding the mantra necessarily, but just the idea that the mantra is somehow powerful and reciting it a certain number of times a day has some power to it. Now... It's not to disparage those teachings entirely, though it does seem somewhat limited, but a, an important lesson here is the difference between intellectual learning, which is much more favored in modern times, and recitation, which is a, quite often looked down upon in modern times. And the difference is really one of, pra of, of a practical nature. In university and in school we learn so many things and we are asked to memorize some of them. But we're not expected to recite or commit all of the teachings or, or, or commit teachings to memory as a main source of learning for, for most things except very specialized uh, careers like engineering and so on. 
some sciences. But if we look at things like religious teachings or philosophical teachings, we're rarely expected in modern times to memorize them. And yet that was exactly what they would be expected to do in the Buddha's time. And the difference is striking. Recitation is really how religion works to indoctrinate its followers. And that can be seen as a very dangerous thing, of course. Indoctrination can be very dangerous. But if you think about a good teaching, something that you have learned and you're sure that that's a good... I mean, there's no reason to think of it as a bad teaching, some general principle, this is good, this leads me to be a better person, this is a wholesome teaching. The indoctrination that comes from memorizing that can only be a good support. You see, if you learn about mindfulness and so on, then you have this intellectual appreciation of it or understanding of it. But it's very easy to have a disconnect between that and your daily life. You've learned this and you agree with it, and then you go about your life without ever thinking about it. If, on the other hand, you recite the four satipatthana daily, or you know, many people learn about mindfulness and never memorize the four satipatthana, don't even know what they are. And that's a problem because it leads to a disconnect. It's a potential problem because there's a disconnect between your thoughts, your ordinary daily thoughts, and the, the teachings that you've learned By reciting them, of course, it doesn't enlighten you There's no magical power to the, to the teachings But it certainly makes you think about them more This is really how our meditation practice works N Not exactly, but the same principle applies By repeating to yourselves pain, pain, or thinking, thinking Brings your mind closer to the actual truth, the actual experience. So, so it's not to to equate the two, but the same sort of principle applies. This is what a mantra, the power of it, how it's more powerful than just an ordinary script that you may have read once. When it becomes something that you repeat to yourself, it is internalized and it's regularized, it's habitualized. It becomes a part of your psyche becomes something you think about often and so it becomes a part of how you incline your mind it's a very easy way if you want to learn an easy way to support your meditation practice memorize some Buddhist texts even just verses like I'm memorizing these verses every week it's a great support for your meditation practice though it isn't a replacement and you shouldn't equate the two when we talk about Noting practice as being a mantra It's important to understand It's not exactly Repeating the word in your mind uh, But it's not so far off Because in order to repeat the proper word You have to be have a connection to the experience And so it challenges you To be connected to the experience But ultimately there should be always a connection Should never be this disconnect Where you would say Rising, falling, rising, falling in your mind Without ever really being aware of the stomach moving It should be related to an awareness And there should be a certain amount of striving for that So this part of the verse is Specifically related to learning But it does tie in with meditation practice And is something that as long-term practitioners We should consider Not just as many people do Reading the suttas Some, some people I know who have read the entire Tipitaka and they can remember certain teachings But actually memorizing some of it Not long parts, but there, you'll, you'll feel a great power In memorizing parts and understanding them Just verses or so on If you understand them and memorize them They become very close to your heart The second part of the verse Anutana malagara doesn't relate to meditation practice It's lack of industry Is a blemish for the household life But as meditators it's an important point That we need livelihood to survive We need a certain amount of income of some sort Even if it's just food and shelter and the requisites Even monks we have to have these things to survive and this requires a certain amount of industry 
And not only that, but industry in general is an important part of, of how we live our lives, even as meditators. One great benefit of practicing meditation, especially walking meditation, is that it cultivates industry, it cultivates industriousness, uh, it cultivates patience, endurance, it cultivates many qualities that are useful and helpful in living our lives with a sense of well-being. Lack of industry destroys our livelihood, it, it causes us to neglect many things about our lives. Many meditators will find that, that when they go back to work after practicing meditation, they are much better able to deal with activities they would have found boring. You know, we have this culture of, of affirming and justifying and, and believing somehow in, in the appropriateness or the rightness of being bored and dissatisfied with repetitive activities, mundane, monotonous activities. But for a meditator, they can become quite soothing and peaceful, and so there's very little difficulty after you've done walking meditation. Walking meditation can be quite unpleasant uh, in the beginning because it's monotonous, it's monotone, it's the same thing over and over again. And that, we have a, a view or an opinion or an inclination, a bias against that sort of thing. That it's wrong, that it's boring, that it's uh, uh, just a, a, a bad thing to engage in. There's a, a, it's a negative quality for something to be repetitive. And of course there's no reason for that to be, except that in order to feed our dopamine, our, our, our chemical receptors in our brain, we need diversity. If you get the same thing over and over again, it doesn't feed the receptors. It, it, it ceases to have the same effect and you need a new and more exciting stimulus. That's why monotonous things seem boring. Not because they are, but because we want our, our, our chemicals. We want our drugs. For someone who is free from that sort of want, they find monotony can be quite peaceful. Even the word monotony has such a negative connotation, but it, lit, it really does literally just mean monotone. It's a, a singular flavor, which sounds dreadful to most people, but quite peaceful to someone who has realized a higher sense of happiness and peace. It has a sense of the strength and composure of one who has found peace. The third part of the verse um, relates to beauty, which again is not something meditators are all that concerned with, but it does bear considering. Malang um, uh, Laziness is a blemish on beauty. No matter how attractive you are or beautiful you are, there's something ugly about laziness. So it's not to say that we should be concerned with beauty, but... It is a good point that physical beauty only gets you so far. For someone who is attached to their physical beauty, it's always going to be limited by your qualities of mind, one of which is, is laziness. If someone is lazy, they, they lose some attractiveness. They lose some of their appeal. There's an ugliness to laziness. And, and this is important because we often over, overlook the fact that laziness is a blemish, laziness is a problem, and we can become quite complacent. We engage in activities that are relaxing. We favor them over those that are taxing or, or those that train us. Now, anyone who's, who does physical training can tell you how beneficial and how gratifying it is to gain something from exertion and from industry. And how laziness actually is inferior. Any relaxation or sense of happiness or pleasure you might get from being lazy is ultimately corrupted by your addiction to it and your your just the lazy state of mind. Someone who is industrious has experienced this state of energetic alertness and, and 
readiness of mind, wieldiness of mind that comes from training. It's one another one great thing that you get from meditation. It cultivates this alertness, this readiness, this energetic quality. The fourth part of the verse is, of course, the, the, the deepest part relating to pamada, negligence. Pamado rakato malang. Rakato is one who guards. Uh, pamada, negligence. Negligence is a blemish for one who guards. It's a, it corrupts. It's a problem for one who guards. Someone is guarding, uh, the, the commentary gives the example of a, someone who is guarding cows or sheep or livestock. And you have to keep your eye on them. If you don't keep your eye on them, they'll wander off and get into trouble, and then you get into trouble as a result. If a person is guarding a gate, we talk about it, we you know how we use the word guard in a conventional sense. Think of a castle or a fort or a city. Someone who is guarding, maybe a security guard, if they are negligent and they fall asleep or they don't keep track of their surroundings, they can easily be overcome by enemies or uh, bandits or crook criminals and so on. They can't do their job. And the Buddha used this sort of metaphor or, or analogy quite often. Because our mind is similar, our mind is so precious and so pure. Isn't in in and of itself uh, corrupt, but it becomes corrupted by invasion, the invasion of things like greed and anger. These things are not intrinsic to the mind. We aren't an angry person or a greedy person. We develop them as habits. And they're constructs, they're artificial, they're artifices, they, they, cult, they develop, they build and they collapse, depending on how we incline the mind. And so the Buddha taught appamada. Appamada, you might say, is the very core of the Buddha's teaching, vigilance. Vigilance doesn't mean anxiety or hyper-awareness or anything. It means not ever letting our guard down, not ever it, it, it means constant awareness, a sort of constancy. It doesn't it doesn't mean you have to be anxious or worried about any lapse of awareness. It means we have to train not only to practice but to create a consistency of practice, a continuity of practice. This is why we teach meditators to be mindful during the day when they're walking or standing or eating or working. Whatever you do, the Buddha said, when you're in the washroom even, when you're cleaning, when you're cooking, when you're doing anything. Because defilements don't take a break. You don't leave them behind and say, okay, I'll come back for you when I come to do my next meditation session. They go with you throughout the day. And they continue to grow and to flourish as habits. Unless we retrain our minds, unless we cultivate new habits. It was the last words of the Buddha, Appamadena Sampadeta. He said, Fulfill yourself in this one teaching. Fulfill this one teaching. Bring yourself to perfection in this one thing, appamada. Vigilance. And so we try to be vigilant, we try to constantly come back whenever we can remember to the cultivation of self-awareness, clarity of mind, Just to remember who we are and what we're doing. Just remember not who we are. Remember what we're doing and what we're experiencing. Remember the reality of our experience and our situation.
because our minds need guards as well. When we guard, when we don't guard the mind, then we develop bad habits. So when we do guard the mind, it's not just that it keeps the mind out of trouble. The cultivating of proper habits, the cultivating of mindfulness as a habit, the retraining of the mind in this way, changes us, of course. And it's not just any type of, you know, it's different from an ordinary type of training because the change that comes about allows us to see clearly everything about who we are and about the nature of reality it's not even just about guarding the mind but it's about straightening the mind and purifying the mind when we when we clean our our houses, we have to keep the house clean. When we clean our minds, the process of keeping the mind clean, of protecting the mind, it's not just defending the mind from these invading defilements, but it's a process of cleansing the mind, cleansing the mind of the habits that give rise to defilements. It just means seeing reality as it is, seeing our experience as it is, training ourselves to have an objective experience of reality. This is what we're doing in mindfulness practice. We're someone who guards, but someone who, who trains and purifies our mind as well. And so the teaching here, the deep, the, the most pertinent part of the teaching is that that practice, that practice of training the mind, purifying the mind, requires vigilance. For it to be complete, it has to be continuous and it has to be wholehearted. You can't just practice as a hobby. Coming to do a meditation course is the best thing, is the great thing. But it shouldn't be seen as a temporary thing should be seen as a pract as a, a a means of really getting a foundation by which to live your life to to retrain the mind and to really work on some deep seated habits like what you see in the in the course anger that comes up fear greed desire anxiety arrogance any anything so many things that you'll see throughout the course to change these about ourselves to change our inclination and to train to to develop this skill a skill that we can take back into our lives and practice regularly practice consistently to make a part of who we are to be able to guard and protect our mind and to nourish and to grow good qualities of mind that will lead us to peace, happiness and freedom from suffering. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening. Wish you all the best.